Hello friends, welcome to another episode of Hybrid Unlimited. Today Marcus and I sit down with Alejandro Medina, who is the recent uh, gold medalist in the super heavyweight class at the Pan American Championships in Olympic weightlifting. Known this guy for a long time, seen him have a pretty epic come up in the sport. Uh, a lot of his story is unknown to the general public and we really get into that into this podcast uh you know like his troubled past as a kid uh him getting out of that uh different people he's trained with who have changed his perspective over the years uh all, all that kind of stuff you know we always get into how weightlifting can be better um what are the things that weightlifting is doing correctly all that kind of stuff so you definitely don't want to miss this one. As always, make sure you screenshot this episode while you're listening. Tag me, tag Marcus, tag Hybrid Unlimited. You'll automatically be entered in a draw to win some Hybrid Legacy brand apparel, which is the official apparel of the Hybrid Unlimited podcast, as well as Hybrid Performance Method as a whole. While you're at it, check us out at hybridstrengthcoach.com. There you can find every program under the sun from weightlifting to powerlifting, uh, strongman, general fitness, everything in between. And you can do all of our programs for seven days free. See if you like it, no cost to you, uh, by clicking the seven days free at checkout. So definitely do that. Other than that, sit back, relax, enjoy another episode of Hybrid Unlimited. All right. This is why Mr. Medina here gets paid to lift weights. And why is that? Paid? Yeah, don't you? This is like, you know that meme? Technically. There you go, stipend. <laughs> There's a pretty good meme that's applicable to this. Does that mean our tax dollars pay for not him? Your stipend? He missed. He missed the cutoff by four pounds. Yeah, talk about that. <laughs> what, he, what happened? What a shitty move that was. Um, so they just uh, redid the the stipend, so I don't meet the criteria for the new stipend, which basically falls under two different groups of either top fifteen in the world or strongest in the Pan Americas. In which case oh, there was you are, but there was a Colombian who did three eighty eight and I did three eighty five. He just did it at Worlds, and the stipend procedures came out the same day that I competed, so I was not aware of them. What so, uh, <laughs> what would have happened? So if if we'll get into this much deeper, but your clean and jerk, he got red lighted on the one eleven, mm -hmm. so he went one twelve for his third. Two twelve, two eleven, twelve. Sorry, uh, two eleven and two twelve. If you had got the 211 your next one was going to be 215 which would have tied that 388 and yeah. then what happens if you tie i'm not sure what happens if i tie Do they go by like are they going like splitting it down to body weight and generally it's whoever hits it first but this isn't like we're not competing but that for guy's a, from a different country right we're not competing for like a spot yeah so i think maybe it's I weird the usaw wouldn't want to promote somebody who's arguably the most competitive american super heavyweight that there is it doesn't yeah. make sense. Preaching the choir. I think your money got spent on a missile. <laughs> <laughs> like a drone strike somewhere. Yeah, it's... Your entire, potentially, like, the next three years or five years of weightlifting stipend probably got spent on bullets or something by the U.S. government. I wonder yeah, how much of our tax dollars went into Medina's stipend. Do you think, well, like, none. He, not many. He just, got, much. he just lost it. Yeah. <laughs> well, before that. So, for, fortunately, though, I do get I do continue my stipend until June. And then like, that's so generous of them. Well, at least I don't, I, I have, uh, there's a, an option. There's a way where I don't have to not get paid for it at all. Right. Where in June I compete again in Cuba at Grand Prix. I hit the total and then I resume yeah, the cool. higher stipend in July. Well, we haven't talked about Pan Ams yet, but what is the Cuban Grand Prix? Cause that's a pretty bizarre place to send weightlifters. So that'd be like sending weightlifters to North Korea to compete. <laughs> it, it, it is. I think everybody agrees that it's super strange. Um, How did they get the ability to even host a meet? They don't even have food. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, but the government has money. You think it's a vanity thing? So wait, what is the meet, first of all? What's the name of it? It's the Grand Prix. Just the Grand Prix? Yeah, Grand Prix. Is uh, it just Pan American athletes? No, no, no. It's it's more it's more similar to Worlds. So it's gonna it should it should be everybody, and it is an Olympic qualifier. So what you do is, is that the one where Il Ilya 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 broke, uh that world the clean jerk world record at a Grand Prix, didn't he? No, that was in Grozny. It was like I think it was, it was in Grozny, right? Like 2015, the President's Cup? President's Cup. Yeah, it was yeah, President's yeah, Cup right, in Grozny, right. which is also a very strange place to hold the weightlifting meet because Russia basically annihilated that area, Yeah, I they, think. Didn't they go to war with, with Grozny's where? Can you pull that up on a map, young George, if you've recovered? <laughs> I'm pretty sure Grozny is in uh, 
Chechnya. It is city in Russia. It's in Russia. Yeah, it's okay. So it's in Chechnya, and Russia went to war with Chechnya and like tried to annihilate the place. And then took we it saw over. pictures of Chechnya after the Russian war. Sure, didn't look good. Didn't look good. And now it looks nice, but that's pretty bizarre. Anyways, yeah, I feel like they pick places with like no consideration for what's actually going on anywhere in the world. So what? Because this, is, this isn't even the first meet they've had in Cuba. What city is it in? Havana. That's nice. Yeah. Wonderful. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Well, I went years ago. As a tourist, yeah. it's a cool place to be. The city yeah. itself, though, is much different than the resorts. <clears throat> do you stay there and like do tourist stuff after, or, is, or do you um, kind of like in and out because the USAW is paying for it? Um. So I've stayed a few times, like in Colombia. I stayed a few days extra. By the Locha, I didn't stay any time extra, but it kind of just depends. Um, if you know, if my family and things like them, my girlfriend want to go, we'll try to plan it out. But I can, I can change the dates. So if you saw puts my return flight, whenever I could extend it for two more days, and they'll still cover no, it. No, no cost for me. Yeah, it's the same. Oh, okay. It's the same flight, right? Or I mean, same. It's pretty nice, though. I mean, it's a cool city. It was fun stuff to do. It's actually this really interesting place. So if you go, check this place out. It's called La Fabrica del Arte, and it's this really interesting art, like bar exhibit thing but it's like got some kind of anti-government vibes going on when i went there and it's it's bizarre like to me it shouldn't exist in cuba because it's so seemingly controversial there's some art that spoke out against the government there and like just it's very bizarre but if you get a chance to go there it's in havana it's like on the the west side of well, the you city can write so. me like an itinerary yeah well, I, yeah and when <laughs> if you while you're at it if you're there and you want to pick up some uh, legitimate Cigars Cuban Cohibas, I'll yeah. give you some money. Yeah, same. Uh, they, they don't buy them off the street, though. The people selling them on the street are <clears throat> You got to go to the Cohiba place. Yeah. It's cool. We'll, it's a cool spot. We'll, cool we'll tourist destination. I don't intend to spend too much time there, but um, we do have to stay there for at least four days minimum. Well, that's okay. interesting. So for <laughs> anybody who doesn't know, we have the recent Pan American champion, super heavyweight champion, Alejandro Medina. On the show today, uh, longtime weightlifter, big fan of your work. Thank you. And uh, congratulations on the win. Yeah, Thank congrats. You. That's huge. That's huge. So you, tell tell us a little bit about the meet and your performance. Um, I mean, we did what we had to do. Uh, ultimately, that was the most important thing. Uh, I had gotten my total beat at the Arnold actually for my world spot. Mm -hmm. So this is the last chance qualifier. So going into this meet, I had to hit a certain total, and if I didn't hit this total, which I've never hit before in my life, I would actually be off of the world team. And lose my Olympic eligibility. What was that total? So, you had a lot of pressure. Wow. Yeah. At the time, it was three. I had totaled three eighty two um, at the at AO in December, and then and what was that like? Snatch a clean and jerk. What'd you hit? One seventy five two hundred seven. Fuck, that's and, big. And then somebody else um, it was a, new, a, a fairly new lifter. Um, his name is Aaron at the Arnold. He had done one seventy two thirteen. So he wow. beat me by a kilo, then taking the number one spot. And then I had the number two spot, so I'm still good at number two. Top two, you know, qualify for all the events. And then at the end of the day, I, like, I got to be better at the time of the Olympics. But as long as I'm top two, I can continue to qualify. The problem was is that um, I had worried that Kane would potentially maybe also beat that total. So at Pan Ams, it was me and Kane. And, I didn't even know he was still competing. Yeah, so exactly. You know, he was potentially going to retire, then came back, and he just kind of wasn't really training. Um, what did he hit, by the way? 384. Oh, so you chipped them. So, yeah. So, but what happened was I hit 211 to try to just secure that spot because I we saw that Kane was going for that spot as well. Yeah. Um. So, and if Kane kiloed Aaron, then I'm the one that's off. Then I dropped a three with Aaron at 383 and Kane at 384. So, we took 211 to put me at 384. Um, and then I got a, a no lift, right? And then Kane walks out, which is 212, which for him was pretty, pretty big considering he wasn't really doing a lot of training. Um, he didn't have a great performance at last Pan Ams. He did 373, so it was a big improvement from that. So I don't think too many people really expected him to come out and hit a total to put him on the world team. He go he goes out, the clean was like looked a little heavy, and he just fucking smokes a jerk. And I just missed 211, and I got one more attempt. And I'm sitting back there like, fuck, I just got booted off the world team. And I had one more attempt to go. Um, so the stakes for this meet were a lot higher than I think what it seems from like the outside. There's a lot, I don't post, I don't talk about these things. Um, but there was a lot of anxiety like leading up to this meet because, you know, you do this, you train your whole life to get to this one competition to try to make it to this one thing. And then it's only one meet that, you know, you can get booted out of, mm -hmm. of, you know, everything that you've worked for. So, um, yeah, a lot went into the prep. Um, but ultimately, like I said, we, you know, went out there, hit 212 and then 
I, which what I thought was the most, the least likely scenario happened because I thought Aaron was going to end up being at least the number two. If I, I thought maybe I would kill him, but me and Kane both. So was Aaron did 383, Kane did 384, and then I did 385. Wow, that's tight. So is that the most competitive class there? In terms of for, first, in, second, in, third? In America, for sure. And to be just to be clear, Aaron did 383 to prior comp. He wasn't at Pan Am's. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, but in, in America, no no classes are that tight, right? Like Nathan is the best 89. Wes is the best 102. Well, Sester is, is, is good as well. But um, it, again, it's two guys, not three. Um, and we also had Kaiser as well. Um, same thing, Hampton, the best 61. So there, there's a little more clear-cut best lifter in every class. So Super is the one that has the most traffic because we got a couple guys in the 370s as well that were trying to qualify for this meet at the American Open and the Arnold. Hmm. So you talked a little bit about the anxiety going into this. How do you manage that? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what do you mean? Like you're just stressed constantly? Yeah, I was stressed uh, for the most time, for the most of it. Um, I had probably like the worst bout of insomnia that I've ever had in my life. And I don't really know. I think in the beginning it was a little bit of anxiety from the competition, but you get anxiety before every competition. I've never had to deal with insomnia like I deal with in this particular case. And I was already going to bed at like three in the morning and then waking up at around 11, not a great schedule, but that's what I was doing. And then once daylight savings happened, I was going to bed at like four and then like one late night, you're ready at five. And then before I knew it, like I couldn't get to sleep anymore. I was going to bed at like eight in the morning. Whoa. Like I, I watched Whoa. the sun come up like four or five times. Like this is like two weeks out. So I'm like, that's the worst. Cause then, you know, like there's no recovering once the yeah. sun comes, yeah, the sun up, comes like, up, I'm, it, this is going to be a tired the, day. It, it destroys <laughs> you like mentally. There's something that goes off in your brain. Once that sun comes up and you haven't had any rest, it's a horrible feeling. So I wasn't getting a lot of sleep and I was trying to sleep in, but I wouldn't sleep. So I'd you know, go to bed at like eight, wake up at like 10, go to bed at like seven 30, wake up at nine. It was horrible. And I actually cut my training back immensely so i was doing like one movement i was walking in i'll do a couple power snatches and just go home because i felt so horrible i remember the following day i walked in did a couple power cleaning jerks and went home but you know, one movement you know it's not normally how we would train right but i guess that's kind of what i did mitigate the stress was for, I just for context what would a normal session look like um well the power snatch and the power cleaning jerks were it was maybe like 10 11 days out it would, it would just be a more complete lift um, power clean and jerks, maybe some sort of back squat or back squat or front squat. And then either I like to do a lot of like block pulls. I don't like to do many pulls off the floor before I compete, but two to three movements, maybe some really light accessories, something like planks or back extensions, not, not any real bodybuilding, but definitely not one movement, three sets, and then you go home. Yeah. And especially not for the extended period of time that I did it for. How um, long was that period of time? Probably like almost like a week. And I, before that I was still trying to train, but I didn't want to risk not recovering to the point where I can't compete, where I figured this way, even if I don't sleep well for the next week, I will still be relatively tapered, right? I'm not beating beating my body down and then not sleeping on top of it. So it's like a double whammy. You're just trying to like be recovered and not get weaker. Right, because I'm get like, okay, we're not sleeping. I'm gonna feel like shit for this competition. Let's not be as fatigued, you know, as, as I could be if I were to do more training. Does having to dial back your training like that <clears throat> in a way that you normally you wouldn't have to, does that affect your mindset going into meet day? did you have sort of like reservations or were you concerned? Like, yeah, I had a really good prep. And so I was feeling really good. And then having such, I don't know, like a setback or such a horrible last two weeks, it was kind of threw my brain into like a frenzy. If you watch like my snatch, you can tell that I'm like strung out almost. I just <laughs> at had at the day of the competition. Yeah. I'm, I like, like normally I'll grab the bar and I'll kind of do like one or two hip thrusts and then drop into the snatch and snatch. And I was fidgeting with the bar almost until the clock went all the way down. I couldn't get my hook grip. I couldn't grab the bar. I'm fidgeting and fidgeting and fidgeting and fidgeting on my 173. Oh, okay. Oh, and, and then I just kept like going down, setting up, going down, setting up. I couldn't get, and then I just fucking yanked on it. And like just, whatever happens, happens. Yeah. And I just couldn't get like my mental right. And I think it was just the lack of sleep, you know, for, for most of the week. I finally got a little bit of sleep, maybe four days out from the competition ironically the wednesday wednesday of the competition was the first night that i actually got sleep and i woke up like really really fucking sick so i was like oh fuck i slept like four and a half hours and i woke up and my throat was killing me i'm so sure your body God, was now worn come... down tired you weren't getting enough rest you're training really really hard you do yeah. two a days right i've done two days on and off i didn't do any of this prep okay. I, I did like light two days where i would train in the morning and do bodybuilding in the afternoon type okay. of thing but i wasn't mm -hmm. doing like the two days that I'm doing right now. Can I you... saw you posted in your story. Sorry to cut you off. No, 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 no. Good, go, go, go. Uh, 
you said you're going to go back to two days. Yeah. Why is that? If you had so much success with not doing that. So that was something that was also in the back of my mind. Cause I've had a lot of success doing the, the single sessions, but I also had a lot of success doing success doing two days before that as well. Mm -hmm. It was the two days. I was doing two days when I finally broke into that 160, 200 range for clean and jerk. Okay. So do you, do you take your, your body weight now into consideration when it comes to training and recovery? I, yeah. And I'm saying this, my question comes from experience, right? Because as a power lifter and I got up to, you know, 140 something kilos at my heaviest. And I noticed that I had to dial my training back quite a bit in terms of time in the gym and number of days, and number of sessions per week, because as a heavier person, the stronger you get, you know, you're having to recover not only from right. your, your, your top line strength, but your body weight also factors into it because you have more mass to also recover from. Like, you know, now that you weigh, what right. you weigh. We recover slower. Right. And I'm. I, I, it's a question I'm curious if you've ever thought about it. I think a lot of people actually don't know that too. Like they think if you're a 62 kilo lifter lifting at your 100% plus versus like a 109 kilo lifter lifting at your 100%. Right. It's not relative. It's, it's not it's, all relative. It's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not at all. It takes you a lot longer to recover when you're right. bigger and you're moving bigger 300 weights. 300 kilos is 300 kilos. It doesn't matter how heavy you are, how yeah. light you are. So yeah, definitely something I considered and, some, and something that I considered of why I had so much success doing the single sessions as opposed to the two. But I'm just trying to dial in even more, sleeping better, um, eating better, and just kind of going, playing it by ear to see like how my body, I know how my body yeah. works. I don't think it's like, a universal answer because like, I, yeah. at least I know with like powerlifting, you know, the absolute weight is so much heavier. So the stress on the body is also something, you know, because like back squatting 400 kilograms right. is considerably harder on the body than 200 you know it's just right so if we're going to be snatching with a high frequency we can do it with more frequency than as you would do a deadlift or a back sure because like the weight sure. is 50 yeah. or 40 percent or well, whatever I, I, and i'm asking just because i noticed when i cut back my training and i changed it this was just because i had a, a new coach at the time who trained me to do things differently it was a consideration i never had before that because i was like oh i can train with yeah. a lot of sets and a lot of volume and a lot of tonnage and then you think okay well if i'm doing that the absolute tonnage on my body imagine you do five sets of six reps or something there's 30 repetitions right there and then take the mm -hmm. weight multiply it out and it's like a ton of work has been done a ton of work's yeah. been done and, and then your body weight increases <clears throat> and your body's having to also recover a greater amount of mass and you know it's it's right i don't know the right answer because like i saw I mean, fernando's there's other, there's other training twice a day and the he, heavier you get you're probably your test is going to be dropping other yeah. things that help you recover are hindered like I said, I don't, I don't sleep. But when I first started getting weight and I would lay down, I would kind of just feel the weight on my chest. It would be uncomfortable. So all these little things, they factor aside from just what you're talking about, the total tonnage in regards to recovering, you don't recover as well. I felt like I slept, recovered, ate my, my eating habits were better when I was 90 kilos, hundred kilos. My metabolism was, was better. I was hungry all the time. So all those things. Yeah. It's one of those things that, factor them in. If you're struggling with sleep, have you ever thought of getting a CPAP? I, I don't think I have any issues with that um well i i mean i had a guy who like had a some sort of i don't know what it was whatever the doctor is that like deals with your nose throat breath whatever all that stuff <clears throat> i was ENT? at huh an ent yeah, your nose and throat maybe or i don't know if it was like <laughs> a breathing know. guy if the lung guy is different than the guy, whatever yeah. but either way uh i was i was in vegas and i was uh at the ufc fight and this guy just walks up to me and gives me his card you told me about this it's yeah like, and i look i'm like <laughs> what's this he's like you have sleep apnea i can tell <laughs> it's like it's just you're big yeah and i'm like I do, but how, but how do you know? And he's like, well, you just have a certain width of neck and, you know, percentage chance once your neck is bigger than a certain amount, you're going to get oh, higher yeah. sleep apnea. Sleep so study like, might not be a bad idea. Yeah, but I I mean, it's been a lot of up and ups and downs, but I've been sleeping well this week. And I really feel like I have it dialed in, like we talked about, kind of just like what doesn't allow me to sleep and what allows me to sleep. Um, and my girlfriend's never... Who's never told me anything about yeah. like well the choking in your choking sleep or, is or wheezing that's a or, big that's a big yeah. sign I that's do, when I do that my girlfriend noticed that yeah. back at the time she's my girlfriend and then I got a sleep study done and they like they only had me in there for like six hours like go home like <laughs> you're fucked <laughs> send me yeah. a CPAP the next day it was I think amazing. for as heavy as I am I'm pretty good with it I'm sure I could probably still benefit from a CPAP but I I don't know how I could get used to sleeping with something on my face it's weird but the quality of sleep you guys like it's, every it's, everybody tells me it's amazing compared oh, comparatively dude. yeah my dad I put got that one on, and he amazing. was just like i thought what i was doing my whole life was normal and the amount of energy i have now is like yeah like yeah. I, this if this is what normal is supposed to be like i 
what I was Having doing was normal. terrible. Yeah, the, the mask is definitely weird. There's no doubt about it, but yeah. you get this weird sense of calm. Like some people can't do it, and it's it's really? sucks for them because I, I feel for them. Can you toss and turn with it on? Yeah. But yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like you got this thing yeah, locked you have to on like your face. Yeah, you know, I, I sleep on my side. That well, that, that's also yeah. what they told me too because I was asking somebody else about it, and they said that it's not even recommended to sleep on your back. If you have no, if you if have you, sleep the weird thing is, if you do, your mouth can droop open, and then you can start to like leak air out of the mask through the mouth because so, you have there's two different types. They have a mask that goes over the nose, and they have one that goes over the full face. And if you do the full face one, it prevents the mouth from opening, so mm. it prevents that the jaw from dropping. But if you sleep on your back. I noticed when I've tried it, my my uh, my jaw starts to like droop open a little bit, and it reduces the effectiveness because when your tongue's depressed up against the top of your mouth, I think it creates a more direct airwave. And I'm not a fucking doctor. Let me preface that, but I think it helps. Um, and, and I know the noise is like white noise; it doesn't really bother. I you. sleep with earplugs, so I'm like a maniac oh, okay. when I sleep. I'm like earplugs in, you know, melatonin and CPAP, and you know. I'm untouchable when you I sleep. You got the sleep right. cocktail nailed down. Oh, yeah. I'm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> to say the least. So I'm really curious about the the, the pathway for you, you know, because you keep talking about the Olympics. You talked about your journey a little bit over the last couple of months. You got the Cuba Grand Prix coming up. <sighs> What's the journey look like from presumably a good total and a good performance in Cuba all the way to 2024 in Paris? So it doesn't really matter what I hit in Cuba other than trying to get on the, the stipend but you basically just got to knock out these qualifiers just to do them you have to do the qualifiers be present for drug testing but the total doesn't really matter like you you asked about maddie how that getting not getting the total she wanted affects her i, I don't unless i'm mistaken i don't really think it does she just has to make the total at the next meet or the meet after that because you have you have to okay. do five of the seven qualifiers and to my knowledge you just have to hit the total whatever total you may need before the olympics and one, one of, of those one of those five to seven right okay. five or seven which is Worlds 2022, Pan Ams that we just did, mm -hmm. the Grand Prix in Cuba, um, Worlds 2023, which is mandatory out of the five. Where is that this year? Saudi Arabia. Ooh, oh, that's, that's actually a cool yeah. one. Be a, it should be a lot more fun. In Riyadh? Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. So they're going to fly you out there first class too? We'll, we'll see. I don't know if that's supposed to be a secret or not. U USAW, if, if you're listening, fly him first class. Come on. He's yeah, way put, too big. Put this to man on Emirates. <laughs> Look at him. He's way too goddamn big to be don't flying Don't let them put you on Saudi. Make them fly you out there on Emirates. <laughs> I'll make sure to put you on the phone when I'm talking to them. Uh, yeah, you, you know what? You, you want to get on my, my agent. agent? talk to my agent, Marcus. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not an agent. I'm, I mean, I am. You could it's, be. It's, it's, it's kind of in your we blood. We do. I have a, we have a real fake travel agency. No joke. But make sure if they do, because that's a long flight. Yeah, it's like yeah. 20 hours. It's also like, think. dude, if you have like 16 from here to Dubai and then <clears throat> Dubai, Riyadh is like another hour or two. It's also just you being to considerate to, to everyone who's sitting around him. Like yeah. imagine you oh. in the middle seat oh. just overflowing oh. on these poor other overflowing. people. Overflowing. <laughs> overflowing and touching and oh, sweating. Right. Especially since you're, you're going there to compete <laughs> yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Right? You don't want to be You need to be up. primed. You need to be at your peak. Right. Yeah. No, you don't I mean, have to fly to Dubai, but from here, the only way to get there is either flying to New York and then Saudi or like J or like DC to, to, to Riyadh, or you can go from here to Doha or Dubai. So Dubai is the best one. It's the best airline. Right. Unless they put you on. Yeah. Well, okay. No, if they fly you business, go on Qatar. Qatar then, is money. Yeah. That one's, that nice. one's I'm trying that this summer. We'll see. Yeah. You'll but like if they fly you any other way, just tell them to put you on Emirates to Dubai and then. Right. Guitar, they give you a little robe, slippers. You just get right at home. Oh, baby. Yeah. You won't be drinking, but they also have like a, a, a yeah. bar you can walk to, like a lounge. You can just chill. Wow. Yeah. Mocktails. They have tons of mocktails, actually. Oh, well, there you go. You can get like a, uh, what, what's it called? What's John drink? Uh, Shirley Temple. Yeah, you can get Shirley Temples. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up drinking so many Shirley Temples. Did you? Oh, I love that shit, dude. So you're going to continue? I had the Sprite Grenadine in my house. Or no, the, the Strawberry Grenadine and then Sprite that I was making them at home all the time. <laughs> I love that I can shit. See. There you go. Yeah, you can, yeah. <laughs> no, it's well to go back a little bit. When I first met Medina, we were at CrossFit Seoul. What year would that have been? Twenty fifteen, maybe. Fifteen, probably. He he was like a skinny dude. Oh, I remember. Sk he had like, to grow into that head. Yeah. Way <laughs> he, less than you. Yeah. Oh my Sk god. Uh, skinny what you, dude. What a glow up. What a glow up. <laughs> you want to call it that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, as one large man to another. You, yeah. weren't, you weren't like weak at that time, but you were kind of still no. novice. Like, what were you doing? Like 120 and 150 or something like that? 120, 120, 
156, 156, 127, 156, I think were like my best numbers. Okay. Around so, that time. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about your trajectory from that to here. Because you had a long time of sort of grinding out, I feel like, at, you know, making little incremental gains. And then you had a period of time where your progress, like you, you just started winning meets and, you know, came to the top yeah. pretty quick. What yeah. was the thing that changed all that? Like just being persistent because it comes in like huge waves. You'll mm -hmm. be hitting the same number for a year straight. And then out of nowhere, you just finally start to kind of break through. Um, so the, the, the biggest thing is just not quitting and sticking at it and being persistent and showing up every single day and knowing that like eventually like this plateau will pass. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's at, when I went to the, uh, the meet, the MI classic, uh, somebody actually brought up when they saw me in 2019 nationals and they were like, yeah, you kind of came out of nowhere. I was like, no, I didn't like, I've been training. I've been doing this for like a really long time. But mm -hmm. like you said, when you finally hit that good total, that's when people, that's, what people that's when notice. they first notice you. But it's like, I've been doing this since 2014 and that was already in 2019. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, the, the, it's just con continuing and continuing and continuing to well, do there's, it. There's a funny saying, it like took you 10 years to be an overnight success. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no one sees all the work, like you just said, up until the point yeah. where you you become you're hitting a normal total at the time. Yeah. You're in the you're, normal. you're there, but you're in the background. Right. Because right? you're yeah. not the superstar. You're not the Kendrick Ferris, the King Wilkes of that time. You know. And then all of a sudden they see like, oh shit, this guy's doing big weights. Like, where'd he come from? Right. And it's like, yeah, I've just been in the fucking corner of a gym for ten years. Right. Yeah. And if you look at my Instagram, I've been posting for almost like every day since I started. So you can scroll and just see the progress from all the way from 2015. I think I started posting early 2015 was there ever like a specific point in your training that something really clicked and you started to make real progress i think i've had pretty consistent progress for for most of it but training training here with fernando i learned a lot. i've been pretty fortunate i trained uh with a couple of really good coaches um i, I started with camilo yeah and then after camilo i trained with somebody who worked who had learned from camilo and then after camilo i was kind of on my own or after that, I was kind of my own. And then I came back here and then started training with Fernando. And Fernando kind of just, I kind of just saw like the, the grit and, and the intensity that you need to be training at. And even the frequency where, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, if this man, you know, he's, he was 30 or 31 years old and he's training with so much frequency, so much intensity. Through injury. Through injury. And like, and, and I just saw the kind of like the discipline necessary where he's like, hey, we're training tomorrow at 1030. And I show up at 1040, he's already on his second working set. Like, he wouldn't text me, he wouldn't call me. Makes you feel like a bum. I mean, yeah, exactly. So I'm like, damn, I fucking suck. I need to get here at fucking 1025. And it kind of just, that, that that discipline kind of took it took my training, I think, like, to the next level. And you can't, if you can't bullshit, if you're going to be doing two a days, you can't be showing up late and then training until four in the afternoon and then you have your second session at 530. Right. So just kind of fine-tuning those, those things and seeing a, a high-caliber athlete, seeing Fernando Snatch, whatever, 170, on a Monday and, and, and then 160 on, a, on Wednesday for reps and then like 180 or 190, just seeing the frequency that they hit these There's these something numbers. valuable about being not the strongest guy in the room too. Yeah, right? absolutely. Like yeah. <clears throat> when you're like the guy who's leading the pack, you're kind of like, you can rest on your laurels a little bit, right? You're like, anything I do, everyone's going to be like, ooh, cool. But it's like when right. you've got somebody to chase, I feel like yeah, that makes that a big there. difference. I felt like that for a long time, you know, being – there was no other person here, like, objectively stronger than me like, mm -hmm. in terms of absolute weight they were lifting. So it's like, I'm just going to keep pushing on my own. But I noticed you have that environment where you're, like, training with somebody that's fucking way stronger than you. Yeah. It creates a fire. Like, you, it's just there's this competitiveness that occurs. You don't even think about it. It's just like, oh, yeah. I got, like, that guy. Like, I want to be as strong as that guy. And it's, like, this very primal thing. You compete every day. Well, yeah. So you try to catch him on a bad day. You, you don't want to be a little bit. Just to get that win. Right. Just to get that one win. And then you try to build off that and keep going and keep going and keep going. Yeah, so what about now? Because you're now you are the strong. You you are in your own gym. Right. And you are the strongest person. So does that affect you negatively? Or do you think you were able to sort of carry all those principles over from your time training with Fernando to yeah, what you're I think, doing now? I think a lot of those things carry over. Like I know what to do now. Like I know what it needs to, what needs to be done. Um, and, um, and I, like this, like Aaron, the guy who, who keloed me, it was kind of like a double-edged sword. Like, okay, now I'm kind of, my spot's in jeopardy, but I kind of like that it like, okay, this isn't supposed to be easy. Like going to the Olympics isn't supposed to be easy. There's always going to be someone trying to beat you. So like that lit kind of a fire under my training as well, where like if he didn't beat my total, 
I would have stayed at the number one spot and then, you know, maybe kept coasting. But I, I but other than that, I think I've done a pretty good job of just I can I push myself. I, I my, my goal is, is the Olympics and I I'm not training with Fernando anymore, but I'm watching what these other people do what these other people do. Like I told you we were, I was watching the twenty fourteen world or watch twenty fifteen yeah. worlds and I'm seeing these numbers. I'm seeing the numbers they hit and these numbers used to look untouchable, you know, where like these guys are on drugs. I can't do that. It doesn't matter, whatever. Like, but it's cool to see, right? Cool to watch. Where now it's like, I'm watching, I watched the, I think it was 2014. They opened up at like 165. I opened up at 165. Like this is the bottom of the A session at Worlds. And then there's a couple guys snatching in the 70s and then the 80s and the 90s and 200s. It's like, okay, we're right. Like we're in the beginning of the A session now. And it fires me up. Like I want to get into the middle of the A session. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I'll never beat Lasha. But, but th- those things are, are really good motivators despite not having Fernando in the gym with me anymore. And like I said, I think it carries over. A lot of it carries over. What's the super heavyweight pack look like these days? Because like, as far as I remember, there's Gore and Lasha, and it's, they were just the top of the top. And then Fernando is third, and now... Who- it's Gore, Lasha, and Lalayan. So who- Lalayan's another Armenian, who Gore actually now doesn't compete for Armenia. Really? Who does he compete for? He switched to Bahrain. To Bahrain? Yeah. But he's Armenian, isn't he? Correct. Why did he switch to Bahrain? Just got his papers to compete to go there. to go to the Olympics. Oh, because because they can only send one Armenian, oh. and Lalayan is better. La, oh, Lalayan just snatched two fifteen. Oh my god! Even though Gore what? has Gore wow. Gore has done two sixteen, but he he uh yeah, I I don't I don't like his snatch. Well, it's not good. It's not good. It's not good. Like it just misses uh, his head by a millimeter. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 it's like it's kind of and it's like right there. <laughs> oh, so he does a If ever there was a guy who lifts a lot in spite of his technique like that's the guy yeah wow yes yeah. i mean i can't knock his strength because clearly he's, he's got Super a great strong. jerk get it done however you but have Lala to and moves really well i've never seen him he's really good um he's probably competing right now at euros right you have to imagine yeah he he gave kind of gave lasha a run for his money at this last competition um, is, it, is, is he fully recovered no so lasha was a little hurt yeah. and then lala was in good shape lasha went out there snatched 215 lala matched name. it at hey, 215. it's our boy who? I'm just kidding. Tate? Tate. Yeah. Um, put, uh, I don't even know how to spell it. L-A-L. Just, uh, put Armenia first or something. Or, or yeah. Worlds. Armenia, or... Lalane. Let's see if we yeah. get it. But, um, yeah, I have no let's idea see, how to let's spell see it. Something like that, yeah. Um, no, that's Simon, uh, so... But that that's them there. So the the weightlifting house video, where he talks about uh, Armenia USA go. Nationals. Gore and Lalayan showed up at Nationals here. Yeah, that, why? That's a, like that, as guest lifters. Yeah, which kind of kind of sucked because I can like I won, and like but they stole all all the thunder. Right. So like you know people are like oh congratulations dude who was a guy that opened up at two twenty right after you finished like wait they got to compete at USA Nationals <laughs> they, yeah, yeah so they, they let guest lifters come in they did right, totals so they didn't count, count they didn't, the totals didn't count but they still made me look like shit <laughs> wow they clowned you yeah so they just they that's terrible yeah no it kind of sucked but <laughs> why do you think they do that just because they know exposure in America is like a good business move for when I, they retire I, I, or I something? have no idea they kept it like a secret from us so like, like we didn't we they... didn't even know we show up to nationals and there's like Egyptians and Armenians fucking in the training hall huh. well because wow. you see all the like Klokov Tarakti all those guys who have been successful post weightlifting careers from those other countries they've all their success came from being popular in the American market, right? Yeah. Doing tours all around America and stuff. So I wonder if that's part of it. Did I? I don't have my phone on me because this video you're not really gonna. You're just gonna see bits and pieces. If you if you look up, just if you look up the world world championships 2022 and and 109 plus. Fast forward to the end, you'll kind of see the the battle between Lasha and Lalian. And it's a type uh, 109 kilo at the end there. Plus yeah. 109. Yeah, there you go. One kilo plus. There yeah. you go. Let's see these there big you go. boys. Damn, Ruslan yeah, see, Lasha enough. versus Gore versus Lale. Didn't right? Ruslan get popped? A while back. He's been competing since. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He, L- he, Lasha did too. He, so, well, yeah, Lasha was, no, was when he was like 16 was or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Ruslan's yeah. was pretty recent. So you could like fast forward to like the... Weird how the, the middle, guys have just popped. Like the end of the snap it's pretty session. pretty strange, huh? It's almost like all the... So yeah, that, that's Lale. Look at that guy. Yeah. Oh baby. Ooh, pretty crispy. God, yeah. he moves good for a big boy. He does. Look at so, that. But, 
What was that? Two hundred one. That's two hundred five. Aside from like, it's like him and him and Lasha, I think would be wow. But he moves the best really well. You're right. among the supers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Man, of course he got the spot. Look at that fucking money. Yeah, stacked like a refrigerator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, and, and the most, it's got to be the back hair. You think, and you think the, these yeah, guys are like huge, hair. but competing with them, competing next to them at nationals, like they're a little fatter oh. than me. But they're around my height. They're not giants. Are they? Yeah, yeah. They're not. They're not. They're just shorter. No, right around my height. Oh, okay. I would, say, I would say right around my height. But they're not like this massive human beings like Lasha is. Yeah. How tall is Lasha? Like 6'4"? 6'5", 6'6", like that. So he's like, supposed to be like 6'6", six, six, but when I spoke to Kaiser, and Kaiser's around 6'6", six, six, and he says that Lasha's not a true 6'6", six, six, so that he, he says he's more like 6'4", 6'4", 6'5". I mean, whatever he is, he's a massive human. Yeah. He's huge. And he, is he recovered from his injuries now, you think? Uh, maybe now. This is already, um, what is it, back in November? So I, I, got, a, I got a question, though. Um, like, at the top level where you guys are, like, do you just talk openly about what you think the other countries are able to get away with in terms of drug testing? I say it all the time. I don't, I don't think anybody's as stringent as America. Yeah. So, no. like... But, like, what, what's America the real thought and process And also any that? Commonwealth the country. What? What's your real... The, like, at least, at least the circles you guys are in you know the top level of usaw like how do you look at yourselves compared to the the pool of other weight let's so we just talked to dylan about this by the way and like we, we talked quite a bit about the future of weightlifting and the future of the sport in general and you know it's compromised position due to, to drug testing right when you have these superstars in the sport like lasha and gore and Ilya Ilyan and dmitry klokov and all those guys who've all already been popped and they're all Records reverse. Not Klokov, though. But we all know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. He mysteriously pulled out. M- yeah. Knee injury. Okay. Mid-flight. Whatever. Hey, but he, he made it out, though. Yeah. He made. He's the only one. Right. Every single other person didn't. So I like, think Noah Kayev also pulled out same meet. That same Olympics. Remember? So they played it smart. But what do you guys think on the inside? And how do you guys think about yourselves competing clean compared to the rest of the world? And does it piss you off? I mean, this is a pretty clear consensus that everybody understands kind of what's going on um but it's almost like two different sports are being played yeah that's but that's kinda... what i like about pan america because i mean i don't think i don't think all the colombians are clean right i don't and again i don't know I actually don't know anything right yeah um but aside from the the colombians like i think pan ams is pretty clean and that's mm-hmm. why I like i think pan ams is a fun competition it's in, it's enjoyable because i don't think that the drugs are running rampant and pan but the, what about the rest of the world because I'm, I'm getting at something with this question i'm going somewhere with it but i want, I want you to answer that first like what does it piss me off or, or does it piss you off but like do you guys like hayden had a good point like do you think you're competing in two separate sports it feels that way some like sometimes yeah right like like being best in america is like its own thing and then you're like well how do you fare up to the europeans so it's like well i don't but everybody knows why would you yeah. uh would you take drugs if it was allowed I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm just not educated on the topic and I'm aware of some of the repercussions of taking drugs. And I would rather not put those things in my body, you know, if I don't have to, mm. I, for me, ideally, like everybody's clean, right? Obviously you're not going to see the weights that you see. Um, and it's not going to be as fun. And a lot of like fans are going to have the opposite opinion. They would want everybody dirty, but like, I That's would, what I want, yeah. Re- <laughs> right, so most people want. I know, and, and I want to see a six hundred kilo or six hundred pound clean and jerk. I, I don't want to put. I don't want to put anything in my body. You know, I. I but I, that's there, that's fine. There, I have a that's sort. Of, there's like I have pride for getting as far as I've gotten without but without doing anything. Here's what I'm getting with this. The, what's the biggest goal of yours? The Olympics. Okay. Yeah. The so biggest I, goal of last is the Olympics. Can I piggyback right? off that? Yeah. What in your mind do you have to achieve? in order to say your weightlifting career has been a success? Is it just making it to the Olympics? Is it a certain placement? Is there winning worlds? Is it something? Yeah, I would say I've I've done the things that I want to do below that, below the Olympics, because I qualified for worlds. So I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to be a world competitor. I'm on the world team. Um, and, and those were kind of my, my list was, was, you know, I've gone down the list. It was win AO, win nationals. It was go to Pan Ams, and then I, I won a little, I think, sooner than I may have thought I would. Oof. And then go to Worlds. Nasty. Um, and I think just going to the Olympics, being the best in, in you know, in America, or, or one of the top three in America. Um, uh, you know, nobody expects me to go and try to snatch 225 with Lasha. Mm-hmm. And, and again, it's understood. It's understood among everybody. Um, when Lasha, or when Gore and Lalayan were 
at nationals weightlifting house actually did like a little interview with me and one of the things he asked is like do you think they understand and i was like what do you, what do you understand like, what that you guys are competing that we're clean, clean and they're dirty like do you think there's a difference like when when they see when i go out there and i do my last clean and jerk and they're going out there it's like do do they do you think they he asked me do you think they understand if this guy has actually been clean his whole life or, or if they even know what they're doing, like, is wrong. I, I know a lot of these athletes, too, that they don't even know they did drugs because they would go to the, the doctor and they said that they're getting a vitamin B12 shot and they're getting trend. Not trend, whatever. I don't know. Whatever, whatever drug they do. bullshit. Of course, it's probably bullshit. <laughs> but these athletes will, will you know, take it to their grave. Yeah. That they were, that they were, they were natural. Sure. I mean, they're heroes in their own country right. and they have to keep up appearances. But let me, let me say something you, about you, that. You, 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 when you're I, done. When you're done. Go ahead. No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, like Coach Ma used to say that he, Coach Ma will claim that he's been clean his whole life. But he mm. also say that he had pain and he'd go to the doctor, get a shot, and then he'd be good. So it's like, and he'd be like, no, vitamin B12. Well, whatever. I just did that today. I'll yeah, be, well, you did PRP. Well, it's a little <laughs> different. But the point is that like, and it's like some of them, I'm sure, are lying, right? Some of them know what's really going on, but maybe there's a couple that are naive, like these, like some of the get people that have gotten popped when they're 14 mm-hmm. years old. Were they really doing that with malintent, or was it forced on them? And they maybe didn't even sure. know, right? Or they're in like real bad situations, poverty, and this is their only way right. out, kind of thing. That's kind of where I'm headed with this. So, like, if you look at a lot of these <clears> countries, <throat> a lot of the countries, people accuse their athletes of being dirty now. This is probably his best path to financial success no matter what you say right like he's the most talented weightlifter probably to ever exist in terms of raw strength Mm -hmm. we're looking at the olympics in terms of its prestige and its notoriety and it's you know all of these great things but you have different incentive structures for every athlete from every country around the world now this guy's coming from georgia right like not third world country by any means but Mm -hmm. certainly a lot i don't think it is Okay. I could be wrong, but it's not, it's not like Ethiopia or something, you know, right. like, yeah. like this guy is doing, you some... can't say third world anymore, by the way, they're developing nation. Yeah. Yeah. Like you show I, could, the two I could say whatever I want. <laughs> so, I mean, if you look at guys <laughs> like that, nations. Chinese and, and Georgian athletes and all these other folks, like, do you, do you really blame them for choosing the best path to success? Yeah, like, cause I, you, like, you, I wish I wish the sport was clean, but I don't care. I don't blame them. I'm not mad at them. I'm not pissed off at anybody. Because a you lot of people mean? are. A lot of weightlifters I've heard from, they, and, and people I've heard talk about it, they get very upset at the idea that some countries are doping and some are not. I feel like the more common consensus is people in America get very mad when someone in America tests positive, but then they'll be like, "Yeah, that happens oh, all well, my time. favorite lifter is Ilya. And you're like, right. Well, yeah. Why? Yeah, you saw it. With like well, there's, there's, like you said, you you hit the hit the nail on the head a second ago. Like people want to see big weights, right? Right. So if you take that out of the sport, is it going to be as popular? Is there going to be a lot of eyeballs on it? Right. And then what happens to the financial incentive? It's already not popular enough as is. Right. So, and I know this is this is an impossible question to answer because the Olympics are predicated on the idea that. Or the weightlifting in the Olympics is predicated. All the sports are right. So clean sport. Yeah. So weightlifting is predicated on the fact that it's an Olympic sport. It's prestigious. It's got history behind it. All this stuff. But it's pretty clear that there's a big doping problem in the sport because what brings eyeballs to it are the big weights, and the only way sure. to really do that, hate to say it, but is this. There's also just a spotlight on it because of the nature of the sport. It's putting the most weight over your head that you possibly can. Right. You know. So there's just like the spotlight that like. Oh, there's more drugs in this sport when the, these drugs are in every sport and all the track athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all, it's just well, that they're going to go fairly track track I think it's because, because of the nature of the sport, there's a little more scrutiny when it comes oh, to the drug testing. Oh, you look like, oh, big man put 500 right. pounds over his head. Like, you're sure something's not going on? Mm-hmm. Right? Right. But like a 9600 is. Right. And they're getting awesome. Awesome. all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Swimmers, too. Swimmers. Well, we put out, we, we talked about this. We've talked about this many times, but there was one podcast where we talked about it. And I said, and it was a clip that we put out on a YouTube short uh, about, I was like, dude, do you think Usain Bolt is clean? Like, obviously not. Right. And it's not, and I said, it's not taking anything away from him because obviously he's an amazing athlete. Yeah, he'd he, be the best if everybody what? was clean, he would still be the best, but everybody is not. And he's still the best. So it's like, it's just a part of the sport that's kind of understood. 
and the amount of backlash we got of people just who obviously had yeah. no exposure to high level competitive sports were just like, there's no way, you know how many times they get drug yeah. tested, this, that. How many like, times did Lance Armstrong get drug tested? He actually never tested positive. Never. He just got routed out it, by it that was little his bitch, Floyd Landis. Uh, passport that ended up getting him. They no, it was Floyd Landis. Well, that started it, but then they they were able to prove. Yeah, they probably went back. But Floyd like, Landis was the, the one that you know, How do you get in trouble without an actual positive test? You have evidence. No, no, no I'm not really aware of the situation. I know he was popped, but I assume he was drug It's tested. called a biological passport. So taking certain compounds over time changes the way that you your your labs come back. So they were able to look at his labs from years prior versus current and time. There's no way that happens in nature. Whatever. Exactly. So that alone is not wasn't enough to uh totally incriminate him it was very good evidence but then he had all these people testifying his, his, uh, and he decided yeah. to you know he came come, out come but clean about his it. uh his, so the teammate he had at the time on team postal service was this dude named floyd landis team postal service yeah usps sponsored it man they were like the gangsters of the cycling world so this guy won the tour de france for like seven or eight years straight france hated him because he was winning their sport you know like this was their national pride all this stuff Eventually, Floyd Landis tested positive, came back, and then Lance came back to a team years later and wouldn't let this guy back on his team. So he got really upset, and then he went to the right. press and talked all, very openly about not only his doping, but the fact that the like the ringleader of this whole thing was, right. was Lance Armstrong. And then the, the wheels kind of blew off the wagon at that point. And... Uh, you know, then he had to come clean, and then there was this massive lawsuit that USPS leveled against him because they thought that it was fraudulent and all this stuff. And but he never once failed a drug test. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. How do wait? How do we get on that though? We, we, we were uh, so we were talking about uh, like the incentive of weightlifters to be really good in a sport that's predicated mm-hmm. on the Olympics, and then you know there's financial incentives for a lot of these athletes. In that's right, because that part of that's got to be frustrating because you know obviously you right let's say you are able to compete on an equal playing field right and your whole life since you were 16 you were able to take drugs maybe it doesn't apply to you because you are someone who would not take drugs either way but let's say you were with you the talent that you have yeah, that's also how i feel thick. now 27 years old where it might have been different if someone gave me drugs when i was 16. sure right? so maybe w- what if you could have been lasha what like the opportunities that come along with winning an olympic gold medal the right. accolades you get all that stuff you know uh, in the weightlifting community it's understood that you know you're a clean athlete competing against athletes who are not so you know you're going to get your respect within the community here but outside of that in terms of like monetary right. gain the everyday person who's walking around being a household name you know it's like people don't give a shit about sprinting for four years at a time and then you know carl lewis or ben johnson or usain bolt you know, wins the Olympics and all of a sudden the most famous person in the world. It's like, that could be you, but it can't because you're not competing on that right. same playing field. It's like, that's got to be frustrating on some level. Yeah, I mean, like I said, at Nationals, right, where you you win Nationals best in the country and then this guy walks out and shreds your total and makes you feel a certain way. And you also know that, like, the viewers watching, like, especially just, like, family members watching, right, they don't know that that guy's dirty. They don't understand the system, how it works. And, um, yeah, it's... So I, I mean, I, I guess I just don't really let it let it get to me. I, I don't. I just I'm kind of focused on myself. I really think that I could hit some really big numbers naturally and compete with a lot of these guys naturally. Like I said, not Lasha, probably not, or not probably not, not go or not Lala in, but um, just lift more pretty than them. Just li- yeah, and and like <laughs> you said, there is respect like in America. Like if you could do one eighty two twenty, you're gonna get respect no matter oh, what. Like, you're still oh, yeah. four hundred kilo. Total you're still sick. strong, and you're stronger than a lot of people that do do drugs in America. That or maybe they don't compete yeah. or whatever. But like you're you're stronger than a lot of people that are on drugs too. Well, you're, also, you're also you're stronger than a lot of people who do drugs in those other countries. Like you're just seeing yeah. the best guy from Georgia. But there's right. a bunch of guys who are doing drugs that don't make it. Right. You know. Right. So, and and it's gonna switch topics a little bit. In your eyes, like how, how would you make, how would you turn the sport of weightlifting around something? Oh, keep, Sorry, oh, I'm clueless. Really? Yeah, I, don't, I just want to lift weights, man. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't have like, I don't have the answer for that. I, no, I just want to lift mean, more weights, and I hope that people care and people want no, to watch. No, but like, you know? all right, and this is the reason I'm asking. We talked about this with Dylan, and it's a thought I've had a lot recently. Is because weightlifting is not as popular as some of the other strength sports, right? Yeah. You look at like strongman, you look at powerlifting even. Powerlifting's become a little bit more popular for different reasons. But right. 
I think Strongman's a great example. It's become very, very popular. There's a lot of fanfare around it. But I'm talking about the actual format of competitions. Have you ever thought mm. about how that could be improved to make the sport more fun and more viewable? That's tough, eh? Because you yeah, have to totally change they, it. They, they've tried. They, they're playing yeah. with those things at Nationals with moving the warm-up platforms and making – like they move the warm-up platforms out to the side so that, that the viewers can see the warm-ups, right? Oh, yeah, that's um, interesting. And that's a, cool. lot of, a lot of people actually got upset because – a lot of people were really upset about it. Ultimately, it didn't bother me at all. I didn't really think it made a difference like people thought it would. But little things that they've tried, I really don't – I don't know because of the nature of the sport. It's just not that – unless you're watching head-to-head at the end of a competition or at the end of a meet mm-hmm. um, or, or some of the best lifters or somebody that you know and somebody that you're rooting for, it's kind of boring. What if it was like – You know, there's not much you can do about it. You'd almost have to like change – the events to like snatch ladders or something like you know like that crossfit right. and then approach get, and then you're doing crossfit so. no but like think about it if the sport's in jeopardy at the olympics which it clearly is mm-hmm. then it has to remain and i'm a fan of weightlifting and i'm saying this it's one of the original to, right i'm, I'm right. a huge fan of weightlifting i used to be a weightlifter like mm-hmm. i love watching it but i don't want to see it die so i I've, right. I've asked this question now a couple times to people and there's got to be a way to innovate, right? Because it, it's basically been the same format ever since it existed. The viewers yeah, it's haven't been re- press anymore, but you're right. Yeah, but yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. Know, like, yeah. you have one guy in terms of the structure of right, the competition. Right, yeah. It's not very viewer friendly, and I think, <clears throat> as much as I hate to say it, a lot of what makes a sport successful is the ability for viewers to understand it, enjoy it, and make it entertaining. <clears throat> So if weightlifting is going to survive, especially if it gets kicked out of the Olympics, I think the, th- the the idea that it needs to remain relevant is a pretty relevant thought to have. Yeah, I do think it should be. I do think it will be in 2028, though. It will I, be in the I, Olympics? I, I I think. I mean. Has there been discussion about that? I'm I'm so removed from any of those kind of discussions, so I'm not really sure. But Piros just said that he thinks it will be. Or that it will be. You know uh, what when, I think when I spoke to him at Pan Ams, right? I don't know exactly the kind of cred- credibility he has in that regard. Mm-hmm. but um he told me it will be and what you know i just okay cool i believe it you know you know what i think's a huge driver of of olympic sports is collegiate sports so i think getting more uh like weightlifting scholarships like opportunities yeah. that you know it's like why are so many people in basketball football you know the majority of the people that come from that you know, obviously some of them are coming from privileged backgrounds, but the majority of the people who are coming up in those sports, they're coming up in those sports for an opportunity because they can go to school, they can do all these things, right? And maybe they wouldn't have the means to to, to pay for it, right. you know, if they don't have but, that. So like if, you, if weightlifting can offer, offer people an education and a step to something else, you're going to see, one, the talent pool get way bigger right if you're a strong guy right even just think of like all the fat kids that were just strong growing up right and they're like what do i what do well, i do with myself you know going to weightlifting and maybe you can get a, an education out of it it's, right. like, it's going in that direction a little bit i do believe there's more schools that offer it now which there's I, a couple was lindenwood the first one i don't know who was the first one but nmu just shut the program down uh but you have like uh, lindenwood you have uh bruton parker you have uh etsu uh the, wherever MASH is at, I forget, Lenore Rain or something, something yeah, like that. Yeah, North Carolina. Know, something like that. Um, I think there's more of them. And then one thing I've, the one thing that's definitely happening in Florida is, is it's a lot more prominent in high school. That's huge. So, that's interesting. Like, well, I, that, I, that leads to. Exactly. It's the same thing. The collegiate. Um, so I, I believe my old school, my old high school has a weightlifting team now. That's and cool. I think for some reason, a lot of them are like women's weightlifting teams. Mm-hmm. So there's not like a, as much men's, but I do think they're, they're both growing. And they were both pretty popular in Northern Florida. And now it's happening in like Southern Florida. Um, and I had this guy who was uh, uh, coaching some of these teams and he was asking to see if I can help or talk to the kids or whatever. And he was telling me the kids that he coaches and he coaches like a uh, kids from Gulliver or, or something like that. And, or, or there's a, he coaches uh, kids from some school. I don't remember the school. And then uh, I saw like the, the team schedule and it's like, Oh, here's, here's against Gulliver. Here's uh, Archbishop McCarthy, or whatever. And I'm like, none of these schools, cause that's a district that I was in when I was in high school. None of those schools had a weightlifting team. I didn't know what weightlifting was until I got to college. So it was definitely moving in that direction clear at least in florida for sure yeah um but yeah having it in college would be would be huge right if, if it can if there's something that can create opportunity like basketball and football where you get a free college or even to help financially post college which doesn't exist right now really because right, you got to right. be best in the country to make pennies but 
if that were to happen, yeah, that's going to definitely help it grow. But in order for that to grow as well, that like you talked about, there has to be viewership and people that enjoy watching it, which isn't really the case, right? Yeah. Like you can't make something popular if people don't enjoy it. Yeah, but there's got to be a way. And I don't know what the answer is yet, but I mean, to me, it's the reason that kids want to grow up and be football players is what? Or NBA players. The love, the, one, the amount of money. And well, one, money, two, fame, uh, three, you see it every day growing up. Like your yeah, exposure to right. it is huge. It, it just hasn't injected itself into the zeitgeist of our culture, so to speak, you know? But it, it's it, become sort of like the, the root of a lot of sports, right? Like now you see every football team is doing power, power cleans, cleans right? so every, they're all, they're every hockey things. team baseball like everybody is implementing right. olympic weightlifting into yeah. as a way to train for but their sport they're still not like aware though like, you no. know what i mean like they do these movements and then if you show so somebody that show somebody that's in college football like the same movement a full clean or a snap they're still like oh shit like they're 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 kind of taking it back well, it's a super impressive movement i mean it's the one of the most impressive strength movements i've ever seen Way, way more interesting than powerlifting. Well, yeah, for sure. I can't watch yeah. powerlifting. Yeah, it's boring as I shit. Can't. But there's yeah. more people powerlifting. There's a lot more people powerlifting. Well, but it's also easier and like yeah. more, more, more. It's more, more for simple. everybody, right? Like, yeah, it's sure. more simple. And it's like if you weren't good, if you weren't good at sports, you weren't good at basketball, you weren't good at football, or, or I think there's a lot, a lot more outcasts in powerlifting as well. You kind of weightlifters are pretty freaking weird. You too. gravitate towards. <laughs> they're, they're definitely weird, but they're, but the high end weightlifters are athletic. Where sure. like in powerlifting, you could be a pretty good powerlifter without necessarily having to be athletic. Right. And I just feel like there's, there's lesser components to being a good powerlifter. And maybe it's also not, you know, so black and white, but it's just, it's easier to do, right? You can just go to the gym. You can start deadlifting a Google program. You can't just go to your 24 hour right. fitness and learn how to do a snatch and clean. And you can also do powerlifting anywhere, right? You can yeah. go, go right. to an it's LA fitness sure. and do squat bench deadlift. You're trying to go to an LA fitness and right. and do a snatch on some crusty bar. It's it right. doesn't spin it's, with metal plates. It's getting a little better, right? Like the 24 hours have like those Alico sets and whatnot, but with the giant, but, the giant but again, plates. right? A, a deadlift, <laughs> sick. It, it's still when you're looking at a deadlift, like okay, I think yeah, I can perform that. Easier. Keep my chest up, whatever. Pull the bar off the ground. Even sure. if you're not doing a good deadlift, you look at a snatch, you're like, oh, I don't want to break my shit. Yeah, and, and people just don't really. You can't drop a deadlift. A lot of people just think the movements dumb as well like they think it's like an unsafe movement why would i do that movement like isn't there a better way to achieve this stimulus or muscle growth whatever without doing this well the only the only counter point i would have is like look at ufc for example right like mixed martial arts wasn't really a thing before the ufc came around and that slowly popularized it but that was good <laughs> a lot of that was due to their business savvy and their ability to pull sponsors and eyeballs to something that was probably seen as pretty crazy when it first came out like it wasn't very popular when it first came out i mean it is crazy it is it's nuts when it's you actually, watch these guys knock each other out it's pretty nuts that it's legal they're it, fucking it, each other up yeah i mean you're it's, <laughs> it, it, I don't, it's the closest thing we have to like gladiators. Gladiators. Yeah, yeah. yeah i can't think of a more violent combat sport except bare for knuckle. well not just bare knuckle but car jitsu, car jitsu is what I was 10 on 10 because. russian uh, uh uh what was it mma yeah it was 10 on 10 or 5 on 5 russian mma we got phone booth fighting the phone, phone booth fighting man. was a fan favorite. I didn't. I wouldn't know what any of these things are if I didn't see your guys' uh, podcast. <laughs> we, yeah, we pulled up probably the craziest collection. Did like you see this. the newest one? What? It, it's an all women's ass slapping league, and I don't know how it. it, it Where can I find it? <laughs> Kareem sent. <laughs> Kareem sent me it. This is all like no Anna White. Uh, no, this, this is all dude, Russia. The, the top comment on this this post was Dana White needs to get in on this. <laughs> No is comment. this 10 on 10? Oh, this, this is, this is in Russia. Four? This is in Russia. It's oh, no. It's a Polish team versus a Russian team. The guy's head's already taped up. <laughs> Don't fight. You're already hurt. <laughs> I think and that's the, the point, man. The Look at this guy. What's wrong with him? He's uh, injured. First of all, he had to battle to get to this fight. He's done. Yeah. Like he's doing like a five on five. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like he's doing a five on five brawl. You think he's worried about a cut on his head? Holy hell, dude. And you guys watched the, the Adesanya fight, right? Oh, yeah. yeah we so, were like, one thing I, I didn't even realize, like Miles Rudow, and they, he, what, he, what he had 50, 53 or 55, 50 something professional fights. And that's not counting like all oh, the, the backyard, backyard days. And, stuff, and it's like, yeah. dude, this guy has fought over 70 times. That's so much trauma. And the way he fights, he's just taking blows too. Like that style where he's, 
he's tough, right? Where he's taking that those, those mm-hmm. hits over and over again. You know, man, it's such a violent. You don't want to do that, dude. I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how many fights people don't people don't normally fight that many times. Yeah, it's what? it's just so much trauma to their brain. So much, so much going on. Unless you're a guy like a, like a Gilbert Burns or something, where you're just yeah, taking jiu-jitsu. fools to the ground. Yeah, it's different. They're great. Or like you know the only then you just get the ears. Or like a Charles Oliveira who does get knocked down and stays there and waits for somebody to come. Yeah, in. Him, man, he takes some damage. He takes of a that. lot of damage. You know, compared to like a Burns. Burns, I think, is a little bit more elusive in the ring. Uh, in the octagon, but like Charles will get was punched. he was he just standing because it was like Masvidal's yeah, last fight. He was, was he just kind of taking it easy? No, or like, uh, why, like why would why wouldn't he submit? I don't know. I, mean, I don't watch enough. Right? Pro- like, I, don't... I love Masvidal, obviously being like the Miami guy, like him being a Miami guy and me being in Miami for the last eight years. Like I have yeah. some Miami pride. I've met Masvidal but, at church. Yeah, yeah. Did well, you? I used to yeah, train sorry. with him at Peak. We do uh, Friday sessions. No, uh, I... he's, a, he's a great dude, but Burns. Just kind of manhandled them for three rounds, right? But I'm saying when, when he had him on the ground, right? Clearly, clearly easy to win that way. And then the the final round, they stood for the whole first four minutes, four and a half minutes. Gilbert Burns likes to stand up and bang. He I don't, does. He watches his stuff. No, before. I don't watch enough. No. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He'll stand up and, and go toe to toe. But obviously, he was completely dominant. You know, taking him down. Yeah, so he was yeah. taking Why him he go down. right back into that to start the round? I, you know, I, it's funny because like a lot of these guys, like like Nate Diaz, is a great example. Like I'm made, like black belt in jujitsu. But mm-hmm. you know, you like, see him stand up and bang the whole time. Yeah, when when I when I met him, who Masvidal yeah. it was like at my friend's like really small church where his dad was like the pastor, and he's just like, um, oh, here's my my buddy Jorge. I don't know if he said Jorge or George, whatever. He didn't have the long hair. He had short hair, buzz hair, whatever. And he mm-hmm. goes, he uh, he competes in like strike force, some something like that, right? And I was like, yeah, very cool, dude. Like, nice to meet you, cool. <laughs> and then like. Obviously, he became this, and I'm like, damn, because I was, I was damn, I, I should have got tight. I, I, I was in high school, I must have been like 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, can you put yeah, that so. replay on of Chimayo versus Burns? That was a good fight. That, but this, that was a good example of what you're talking about the Chimayo uh, Burns fight, where Burns they fucking yeah, there's they yes, that was a really each other. There's that, a great fight coming up, you know, Olivera's fighting uh, Benel Darush. Oh, that'll be a good one, like, for sure. Draw. And he's like, so think about it. This guy is you see, uh, top level wrestler versus a top level jujitsu guy. You see, Nate Diaz is fighting Jake Paul. Also. Boxing, yeah, that's an interesting one. He's gonna make some money. Yeah, good, for, good for Nate uh, Diaz for sure. Man, Kamzat was a uh, oh, he clipped him. Big boy in this fight, but Burns got him good a bunch of times too. Yeah, they said that uh, Chimai really like got sucked in and. Uh, like pulled away from his game plan like Wait, burns kind of you see this is it. like the thing right so it's a podcast about weightlifting or watching mma because it's more exciting it's well, like somehow we gravitated towards this right when yeah. we're supposed to be talking about snatching <laughs> clean and jerk right it's kind of my point, point. That's, that's it is scary. a good point but this is also just but i bet you these guys do power cleans <laughs> maybe not Nate Diaz. maybe but, not Nate Diaz. <laughs> i think he smokes blunts that's an exercise <laughs> but yeah, to your point, like it's tough, right? Because part to me, like when I think about the Olympics, I think about what the the essence of the Olympics means, and what that has always meant is finding the purest forms of you know it was based on combat back in the day. So who's the strongest? Who is right. the fastest? Who can jump the highest? Who can jump the farthest? Like all of these basic human. Uh, sort of like expressions of athleticism and in modern times we've gotten away from that a lot which is okay but we're incorporating all of these like games right like basketball is a game you know soccer is a game uh american football right any of that shit it's the, yeah. these are all games that were that are not while they are entertaining and i will watch them and i'll support the countries that I like to support in those, those sports, they're not the true essence of what the Olympic games are all about. So when you talk about like removing wrestling or removing weightlifting or any of these things, it's ridiculous. I'm like, this is, it's bullshit because, and they put skateboarding in and (coughs) skateboarding is crazy. Skateboarding, surfing, surfing. Like weightlifting is the most pure, you know, contest of strength, power, athleticism, speed. It's you're trying to find who can lift the most like that is it, it, olympics is all about the basic human physical attributes and finding who is the best at each one of those things so it's like when you start incorporating all these other things it's like great they're popular right but 
every they want time eyeballs you, on the sport or on the, yeah, on the but games. They, but I think if you never introduced those other sports, then the Olympic Games would have stayed true to what it is, and people are all going to tune in no matter what because of national pride right yeah. just like i said nobody gives a shit about sprinting for four years at a time maybe that's why you know, all of a sudden everyone tunes in you know but like, it, it takes away from the olympics almost when you start incorporating all these these sort of more game-like sports you know and now it's like yeah people are going to watch basketball because basketball is a huge sport in mm -hmm. america but if basketball was never introduced into the olympics then mm -hmm. and your options are only the things that have always been sort of like the pure mm -hmm manifestation of of human athleticism then you're gonna watch that because that's what the olympics is but that's another th another point you mentioned like you watch with pride right yeah it's hard to watch with pride when the best americans in the b session right so like you're less engaged we're like in these other sports like basketball we win you know so you do that's have that point. you have the pride we're in it like because it's hard like so many times when the olympics are going on you know you, you turn them on and you're like, oh, is there an American in this session? No, you're like, I right, just look for, you know, something else. For me, right? Especially if it's something you don't care about. Yeah. Um, but the the, the, the you're going to be lacking in that pride when, I guess it goes back to what you said, we're not on drugs. And we can't And I, we I can't hate to compete, bring the conversation you know, there. I hate to. I, it's not. It's I, a huge part of the sport. It's just, listen, and I'm saying this and I ask these questions and I bring this shit up because I love weightlifting. I love seeing in the Olympics. There's nothing that informed like where i am now more than watching old videos of, of the top sessions in the olympics and worlds and all the strongest mm -hmm. weightlifting. sick it's sick it would get me fucking fired up right. i mean it still does i'll still go back and watch Ilya Ilian sessions and you know yeah, i've seen that 242 so many times so many oh, yeah. uh, the so 246 of him in right. grozny that one time was the coolest thing i've the ever 242 seen 242 was just a, a battle of the right. back and forth yeah. obviously but, in the sick. Like, but those battles are what made the sport so popular because then there's a story right why do you want to watch fucking Israel Adesanya fight Pejera because they have a seven year history or whatever it is mm -hmm. and they've well, been fighting each other for, for almost a decade yeah you know? I guess that that goes to what or to what you were saying is there needs to be a story for these things like e even for something a little smaller scale obviously like my competition like nobody knew what was on the line with that 212 nobody knew it was on the line with Kane's 212 prior with my 211 prior well, people, because people just production. see the number of that winning right the yeah. commentators don't even know what's going on. Yeah, the production so quality that, sucks. But do you think you have a little bit of a responsibility then to tell that story? But it's not him. Like, it's not no, him. I don't want to tell it's, my own story. Like, I don't want to tell this. Like, I want to create a story so big that people, other people tell it. You know, I hate telling my own right. story. Like, I mean, I'll hop in a podcast. You know, at the beginning of, of the UFC, how they always go back and they'll talk about the history of the fighters. Mm -hmm. They'll talk about the story, how they got there, or they came from the favelas of Brazil, or they... You know, came from the mountains of Dagestan or whatever the story is, but they create a narrative. You're invested in this guy's story. You want to know yeah. if Izzy's going to be able to finally beat this giant Brazilian man who's been kicking his ass for the last seven years. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, shit. Like, this is a really interesting thing to be engaged yeah. in. Yeah. So, but because weightlifting doesn't have that right now, I think you need more of this. I think you need to do more podcasts. I think people who have a story to tell need to do more podcasts. And, and yeah, talk about real yeah. shit and get people engaged. You know, if it's if if the I, popularization of weightlifting yeah. is important to you, if it's not, then whatever. But you know, it's like you're not going to get those media outlets, but you might if you go on a bunch of podcasts right. or you, you know you 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 do it yourself, That's and then I it's said interesting. Yes to this one, yeah. Well, there you go. Wanna, you know, but like, yeah. There's these. I think the main thing is these stories that aren't highlighted. They're starting to be highlighted now more. Uh, Will like Will Barbo stories. And I believe YKS, they're both working on it with, with like Maddie, Kate, uh, Jordan De La Cruz and, uh, and Mary and about their journey to the Olympics. And they're, they're, you know, doing full, I haven't watched it yet, but I believe they're doing like full, I don't know, 45 minute hour episodes, whatever they're doing full episodes and kind of giving you a lot more backstory. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people tuning into that. So that's becoming existent, right? Like it wasn't existent at all in American mm -hmm. weightlifting. All we have from 2012 are American open highlights and um national highlights and like no stories and no nothing and just, they could just, weave just that the in to like the actual competition day yeah. if you're watching like you have no context like who the fuck is this guy he's a giant exactly. man from miami he's very strong but One you don't big understand guy is his story more than another big guy right right like, now you yeah. realize like oh shit this guy's been training for well think about 10 years 12 well, years and you're you know you setbacks well, all right. the most publicized talked about weightlifting event in the last two decades probably steiner why yeah, was that story 
The Snyder right. Cut. That's a good. That's a great point. Dan- like, Dan- Snyder's Dan- the only Dan- one that come that you see posted on just like regular fitness yeah. pages and all whatever time. all over Instagram because of story. Right. Wife died. He promised her he'd win the Olympics. He had to overcome. You know, he had to hit a huge PR to do it. Does it? Cries on the platform. Goes up there with his wife's picture. Right. You know, and like all that stuff. That's yeah, people. People want a story, and I. I, I I think that might be the only way to really make, not the only way, one of the only ways to make weight, weightlifting that interesting. But everybody um, has but, a story. Right, yeah. but nobody, but it's, it's so it's small scale, nobody's tell telling story. it though. So if you tell somebody's story in a compelling way, like even these guys just, you know, they grew up fighting in Brazil and now all of a sudden they're in the UFC and it's like, it's a big deal to them. But if you tell the story the right way, it's like, it's like imagine you're an advertising company, you have a media company and now your job is to make this product. How do you make head and shoulders interesting? Something that's completely uninteresting. There's a way to tell every story. It's just a matter of telling it and delivering it well. And I didn't try to set this up, but this came here perfectly. You have a story that's very interesting that I don't know if you've ever spoken about publicly, but you were going down a not good path for some time. Right. Right. And you completely turned it around. Yeah. And you went from basically the opposite of what you're doing now to being completely dialed in and focused on like one task. And yeah. I don't know how much you want to talk about it, but I don't mind talking about it. So yeah, if you, you want to start I, I, with what, what that bad path was and like, what was the, you know, ESPN I, turning point of that whole I thing? I actually started a, I, I mentioned some of this with a podcast and John with John North, like in 2017 after I meddled at university of nationals, but haven't talked about it since. That was a long time ago, and I don't remember how much detail I went into, but um, and I started doing drugs early. You know, I was doing a lot of already a handful of drugs by when I was 13 years old, uh, to the point where I even got Baker acted when I was 13 years old. Wow. Um, so yeah, not not good. Uh, I won't go into like too many details, like what I did, but just it was enough for that to happen. Um, and just kind of in and out of that lifestyle from 14, 15, 16, 17, and trying to do things better getting involved in the church, but still doing drugs and then going back and forth and around 17, getting into more of like psychedelics and college, trying to, college didn't help at all. Obviously I went to college somehow and then I ended up getting dismissed, dropped out of college. Um, and uh, well, I'm, I'm skipping things here. When I was 17, I also got, you know, so when I was 19, I got kicked out of the house because um, I got arrested for uh, selling and uh or supposedly selling right so and and i think that was kind of the 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 turning point there's so many things that happen so telling it it's kind of scattered trying to remember how it all went down right um but the the turning point was really being arrested for the second time both for marijuana offenses and just um you know being being in jail and then going to felony jail and not being not knowing how i'm gonna get out and calling my mom and hearing the way how my mom was heartbroken and uh and how my, my dad thought it would be better for me to stay in there when I called him and I asked if they could, um, if he could bail me out. And he told me that he thinks I should stay, which ultimately, oh, tough. yeah, but I, I have such a good relationship with my dad now. And like, at the time it was horrible. Like it was brutal for me to hear, but it's like, this wasn't my first time fucking up, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, how old were you? I was 19. Time? It was six days yeah. after my birthday. So I got, I just turned 19 mm. and this is already my second time being arrested. And, um, and, and I got Baker acted when I was 13, I was already doing stupid shit when I was 13 on and off causing trouble. And, and my dad had <clears throat> remarried and had two younger kids in the house already. So a three and a six year old, and I'm out here doing stupid shit, living under his roof. So, you know, I don't, I don't blame him, but it was, it was rough. Um, so and then I finally got out and went back home and, you know, he wouldn't let me back in. So just, he wouldn't even let me in to grab my clothes. You know, they left the clothes outside. And I started just living with friends, going from couch to couch for a little bit. My grandparents found out that I wasn't living at home and they told me to come live with them. And then my grandpa gave me a second chance at everything and started working, got a full-time job. And then after working for six months and getting clean, I decided to go back to college for the second time. Wow. Went back to college, got my grades back up and actually got back on the football team in 2018. Quit weightlifting. Um, cause that was my goal. I loved weightlifting, but I love football even more. And I completely botched that opportunity in my first round at college. Um, and, uh, well, I got, I got dismissed and I had like a 0.6 GPA. So I didn't do the classes where like, you just show up and they give you the A, like I just wouldn't even show up. So I had, it took me two years to bring the GPA back over a 2.5 to be able to play football again. 
And it's just, it's just been ever since being arrested in 2016, it's been a constant battle to like kind of just prove myself, get back the trust of my parents, my whole family, my dad, my mom. Um, and weightlifting, I think, has been a pretty integral part of that. You find and, it gives you purpose now? Like yeah. a reason to be like a good person? Yeah, to, to, to a certain extent. And just reason to just... It, it's such a strong motivator to not get into like other things. You know, it's the easiest thing. People, um, my dad including, think that I have like really strong willpower. Right? Like I told you, I haven't, I haven't drank um, for years. Um, I remember the last time that I smoked pot all these different things and um it's it's not even that i have strong willpower it's just more so that i want to go to the olympics i want to be the best with that i can so bad it makes it easy to kind of not do these stupid things so definitely serves as um you know a mechanism to not do these things that i was doing my whole life before i had weightlifting yeah so, you have something that's way more important that's way more of a priority right so yeah, yeah it's um that's that's a pretty good story I wish I told it better. I feel like I was jumping around. I, I think you told it too much. Told, told it the way you wanted to. But um, yeah, man, you, you you know you hit rock bottom, and at that point, you know, if if you don't make the changes, yeah. Do you have regrets there, or do you think like you you wouldn't be where you are now if you hadn't gone through that? Yeah, I think it's important. I think it, it was like a pretty big part of of my growth. So, so you, you can like, would you look back and change your dad not bailing you out, for example? No. Yeah, no, right. And at the end of the day, I got a bounce company. And I was only in there for two days. It's not like I had to sit oh, for okay. forever, right? Um, but you were in there with some characters, I'm sure. Yeah. It was, I, not, it was not good. Because <laughs> you're, I'm in TJK, and it's like felony jail looked like prison to me. Like, I'm, I've never been to prison, so I don't know. Maybe it's a lot worse. But, you know, you're you're in this cell. You're not like in a holding cell in jail. And you have your roommate, you have your hour, two hours, whatever they give you when you when you get out for, for lunch or your little recess break or whatever. <laughs> and um, I had my the guy that I was with was like clearly a fucking lunatic. And the people in there were like all fucked up. Like I remember this one guy, they wouldn't even let him out of the cell. They would just let him like leave him in there because like he was just like fucked up. I don't know if he was on drugs, like they booked him the night prior and he was just and he would just be in there like it's erratic, just like kind of dancing. And like getting all up like close to the fucking the little door and just saying all sorts of fucked up shit and just just like I'm like I'm like fucked up because I'm like I'm young I'm a little nervous I'm like I don't know what's going on here and these these people in there are like not they're not like not like me <laughs> so and that was another another reason I'm like I can never go back to that like this guy was threatening me like if I took a shit you know what I mean which I, I kind of don't blame him you got like the two bunk beds. And then the toilet is probably like a foot from his face. And I'm like, dude, I got to take a shit. And he's just like, bro, if you fucking shit. And he, like, he, like, I don't remember the exact words <laughs> oh he said, God. but this guy, like, and I don't know if he has like a fucking shank. Sorry for laughing. Or something. So, like, terrible. I don't, I don't want to take a shit and then like, fucking stabs me in my guts, you know? So, <laughs> Jesus. And, uh, so yeah, I didn't shit for two days. So, and, uh, God, you must have been so backed up. I don't know, man. My head was just kind of yeah. spinning the whole time. Yeah, it's probably the least here. And then, like, <laughs> My digestion was obviously all thrown off because of all that. And you don't sleep in there either. The corrections officers are like blasting music at two, three, four in the in the morning. They kind of they're kind of bigger dicks than the than the other people that you're in there with. At least for me, they're like blasting. Yeah, I'm sure like they fucking have a power trip going. Rick Ross, like loud as fuck, because they're working the overnight shift. They're trying to stay awake, but like, yeah, yeah. it's four in the morning. Like I know, I know your schedules know, are colliding. No, we're in jail, bit. but like, come on, man. <laughs> well, be considerate. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of ups and downs. Um, ironically, I still lifted through most of it. Yeah, yeah. Like when I started lifting when I was thirteen, so, so. some consistency there, like an anchor for your life. Dude, I'd be on drugs in the gym, like fucked up. That's so impressive. I was, I was <laughs> not a good way. But not, like, <laughs> I, wow. I, I remember one time um, when I was visiting my friend from UCF, and I think I was still like eighteen. Or 19, so I wasn't that old. I'd have to scroll back. The video's on my Instagram somewhere. Um, or, like, we were just messed up doing, you know, a lot of different drugs. And this is one of the times where I didn't go to the gym the whole week. And we were doing, like, you know, different psychedelics and acid and coke and just not, not you know, not sleeping and just, you know, being assholes. And I went to the gym on, like, the Wednesday or the Thursday up in the middle of the week. And I walked in the gym and I pulled 540 for a deadlift. And uh, just went home and then started doing more drugs. 
Oh you know, like e- this, 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 even when I was like pretty good. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, e- even when I was doing this stupid shit, I still like love to go and hit heavy weights. Obviously, not con- with the consistency or the discipline that I right. have now, but um, I, I definitely, you know, I was training throughout, you know, most of my fucked up times. So, like, the, that's the first thing I did when I got out of jail was go right back to the gym. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think that that. That's a really important story to tell because, you know, this in Miami, I'm sure, and in a lot of other places, there are people who are going through that shit. And a lot of people can't pull themselves out of a shitty situation like that unless they have something else to go to. And I think fitness in many, like all the different areas of fitness, depending on what your interest is, that is is such a powerful and addictive thing that it can almost be like a drug as well. And I think that's why you see a lot of even ex addicts, you know, hold on to the barbell, get so into fitness. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's something that's a healthy outlet that they can get addicted to that, that sort of fills that void of, you know, of what they were doing before. But, you know, if there's anybody out there who's, who's listening to this and hopefully is going through some shit like this, like you were, you know, like that's a that's a really powerful story. And you went from literally, like you said, rock bottom to now being the best weightlifter in the country, winning Pan Ams, you know, fighting for an Olympic spot. Like that's a I that's something that yeah, yeah, that shouldn't yeah. be, you know, taken lightly. That's yeah, a huge, that's a great story to tell because you're that's an inspiration to people. Yeah, you know, like yeah. you might not think about it, you're like, oh, I just did all this shit, but like there's probably people out there that are thinking like oh, I'm a piece of shit, I do drugs, I'm fuck up, I kicked out I'll of school. I'll never do anything. It's like, dude, if you can do that, right. Like somebody hears that story, like there's your fucking, there's your storyline. You love anime, right? That's a good arc. Nerd. It's a, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of <laughs> some fucked up arcs in my story, but um, <laughs> this is a good arc right now, though. No, the but Pan you know what? Like, was pretty good. Everybody loves a comeback <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 been it's, it's been cool the last few years, especially the people that know my past. Right? Yeah, and I mean, now I kind of gave a pretty somewhat not vague, but you know. No, it was, you know, it was good enough. Right. Of, of the things that I've done. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's, it's, well, we appreciate fun. you sharing it. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty open about it. Yeah. It's, I, it's worth hearing. Yeah. I think a I, lot of people would appreciate that kind of story because you never know. You might hit somebody, you might hit right, one person. Right. Yeah. And that's and that one person, you could change their life. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That would be cool. Well, with that be being really said, cool. uh, what's up next for you? Um, well, like just the, the meet in Cuba, get my stipend back or try to get my stipend back. Right. And then my first world's in Saudi Arabia, Fuck which is going to be, going to be sick. Right? That's Saudi so Arabia cool. is going to be, um, also, I forgot to mention, uh, in regards to like the, the success that I've had for team USA, um, I still text my lawyer. Like I texted him my medals. I, I messaged him like when I made my first Pan Am team. Whoa. And he was like stoked about it. Like he vaguely remembered my case. And then I was like, I called him and talked to him on the phone because we hadn't spoken since like 2016. And he was like, he was pumped about it. And like, that's so cool. One of the things that, and I swear to God, one of the things that we, that we, you know, that, that we talked about was that I want to be on team USA. And that's one of the reasons I reached back out to him. And he, one of the things he told the prosecutor was that like, I have a goal of being on team USA and I made a mistake or I've made some mistakes, but I've been training hard and I've been working hard and I can't be on team USA with felonies. So that's something that he actually, you know, told the prosecutors and, and I'm sure at the time he's thinking this 19 year old kid is, you know, full of shit, but whatever. Right. Like, and, um, you know, then, so that's when I was 19, 26, when I first messaged him from the first Pan Ams, cause I messaged him after my first Pan Ams in Columbia and again at 27. So seven years later, I messaged him about the going to Pan Ams, making team USA and even got his advice because I actually had to appeal it because I failed my background check because of this incident. Really? So I actually had to appeal it, talk to the board just to get on Pan Ams. Wow. Um, uh, and I relayed all these things to him and he was like ecstatic. And he even told me that his wife wanted to have me on for a podcast because she does like well, I think sure. some sort of like self-help podcast. Well, yeah, and you should thinks, do it for sure. So it would be inspirational. But it's a good idea. It, it's really cool. Um, th- those are the most important things to me. I, like I want to go to the Olympics and that's amazing. But after all the mistakes I made and then getting back, um, like I said, my parents trust and like my aunt sending me pictures of my grandparents, like watching my Pan Am performance and things like that. 
And then like being able to tell this lawyer that, you know, the things that we did at 19 that you helped me get through, helped me get off the case, off this case and, and allow me to continue training without the felony in my record. It's like, you know, they, they mattered. And I feel like I made it, like I, I can show them that like it, nothing was for nothing. Like, like I, I did what I had to do and, and I appreciate everything they did for me back then. And now finally I get to make them proud. You know, my grandparents, even someone like the lawyer, my dad, you know, um, that, that's been, I think like the peak for, for me so far, aside from, you know, winning Pan Ams is just making these people proud again after, you know, making things so hard for them when I was a teenager. Man. So. Unbelievable. That's a great story. That almost didn't come up by the way, but you guys set me up perfectly for that. I'm glad, I'm glad that happened. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So where, where can people find you now that they know the story, social media, business, all that stuff. Uh, my Instagram is Medina underscore Island. So pretty, pretty simple. Not really on much else. Um, only fans. No only fans. Not yet. But if I don't get my stipend back, <laughs> <laughs> you hear that Team USA? Don't make this man post unspeakable things. And fly him on Qatar or Emirates, please. Put the man on Emirates. My dad told me it's technically pronounced Cutter. Is that correct? I don't know. I'm not Arab. I'm Canadian. Yeah, I'm Jewish. I'm as white as they get. Everybody says guitar, and that looks and sounds correct. But I'm curious. We're no experts. When it comes time to selecting a flight, let me know. Okay, I'll yeah, ask them. Well, after after Saudi Arabia is Qatar or Qatar, Doha. Oh, when's Doha? So, oh, and cool. that'll be Grand Prix too. Oh, you got a direct flight, baby. You can't go on nothing but Qatar. Yes. <laughs> Q suites. I'm excited. You're talking about the slippers we'll and the and the robe. We'll talk, oh, baby. We'll talk. If they put oh. you on Emirates in first, uh, yeah. I don't know if they will, but I can hope for you. We'll see. We'll see. I really don't. Uh, right. Well, don't bro, this has been getting. incredible. Thank you for sharing everything with us. Thank and, you. Uh, that's it, guys. Thanks All for right. tuning in. Thanks for listening.